egun hon, berriz ere, hemen geha, gai interesgarri hauek lantzeko asmotan. Eta gehiago luzatu gabe, berriz ere itza emango diot Bradlowen jaunari. Eta berak gaur bai itza ingo digu. He's going to... Speak today about um, uh, the research that been, they've been carrying out and they are uh, still carrying out in Canada about uh, Basque vessels and uh, Basque wrecks. He's repeating the same thing over in Spanish. Contamos hoy de nuevo con Brad Lowen, que hoy nos va a hablar sobre las investigaciones que se desarrollan en Canadá en torno a las embarcaciones de, de origen vasco. Brad. Eh. All yours. Good morning again, everybody. Um, I think I'm uh, uh, not quite as ready today as I was yesterday because uh, somewhere along the, uh, along the line with our power shortages, my printer failed to produce a text. So I'm going to be working with something like this today. But I'm a university professor. I'm used to improvising. So we will do this uh, and we will enjoy it. Do you have one hour? Yes. OK. <laughs> um, so we have a question here in front of us. Uh, why do we study shipwrecks? And of course, the main reason today here in Donasti is that we want to know more about the, uh, the, the example of the Nau Vittoria. This is what we tell ourselves. From a, a university perspective, so I'm a professor, I have students, and I, I try to find out what the students' motivations are in order to communicate better with them. Uh, so when I sit down with a new graduate student, I ask them, why are you interested in shipwrecks? So the student says, well, uh, I want a job. Um, that's usually the first thing. But when I talk with them a little bit more, um, I discover that they have really interesting motivations and they are often quite personal as well. Uh, some of them, um, some of these motivations, uh, I think we can understand them just by listening to people. For instance, yesterday when you were listening to people, listening to the speakers, you heard the word Basque an awful lot. We are learning about Basque shipbuilding. So one of the reasons why we study these ships is we want to learn about Basques and we want to understand the Basque identity and the place of the Basques in the world from the 16th century onwards. This is a way of projecting the national <laughs> identity of the Basques onto a global stage. And this is an important objective. But there are a lot of other reasons as well. And I won't talk about the Basques today. I'll talk about Canada, because I'm from Canada. And uh, hopefully, the example of speaking about Canada will give you a few keys to understanding what you see here in the Basque country. Now, when we look at 16th century shipbuilding in Canada, this is the image that is the most often used at the beginning of any PowerPoint presentation. This is a map from 1554, uh, Desaliers, so it's a French map maker. It's a map that shows all of the New World, and in one part of the New World, you see it here, it's upside down, but this is, I'll just point it out. Here you see Newfoundland, this is Labrador here, this is the Gulf of St. Lawrence, so the north is down here. And here you have an interesting scene, you have a couple of ships. So here's, a, here's what we think is a Basque ship, a whaling ship. And here we have a whale with nice fancy mustaches. And here we have a crew that is hunting the whale. Should we do a zoom? Let's do a zoom on this. So this image has been analyzed an awful lot in Canada. And People analyze it from different points of view. Uh, I've written a text on this particular ship. I don't think it's a Basque ship. I think it's possibly from Brittany. 
and I could explain why and all the details, but you can see this, the, the last uh, mast here, it's been analyzed as a, as a 16th century uh, rigging structure and so on. Um, other people have worked on the whale itself as a symbol of the of sailor's fantastic view of the sea and with these sea monsters and so on. Um, and one of the most interesting texts that I've read on this concerns this group here. So we have a harpooner here and a couple of rowers. And this person here, we don't know who he is because he seems to be holding a bow. And as far as we know, the Basques did not hunt whales with bows. And there's also the question of his hat, which is seen as a typical Basque bonnet hat. Uh, there's also the question of his clothing here. Some people say this is a priest. So there's been a lot of discussion around this identity. And why are people interested in it? Because they want to know whether the Basques hunted with indigenous peoples and whether there were religious figures on board the Basque ships. So this image is often seen as a starting point uh, uh, to get into the Basque society that did the whaling. So the second most Im important image that's usually shown when we talk about Basque ships in Canada is this one or something like it. This is a model of the Red Bay ship. It's, it's under construction with a model maker. His name is Marcel Gengra. Uh, so this, this model is in many ways a symbol of a new way of, of doing archaeology on shipwrecks. When Parks Canada did, this, did the excavation back between 1979 and 1985, uh, the old way of studying shipwrecks was to draw a map of the site as detailed as possible, uh, remove some artifacts, and then publish that. What Parks Canada did, and it has now become the standard way of excavating underwater ships, is that they disassembled all the pieces underwater Every single piece was taken to the surface and drawn individually, and then the pieces were reassembled at a one to 10 scale, and also they were studied that way. So this was a new way of doing ship archeology. span It was a triumph for, for the archeological discipline. To such, a, such an extent that here you see this model, and here you see the logo of the UNESCO Underwater Heritage uh, Charter. And they actually took this model as a symbol and projected it onto the world stage as, as a symbol of how to study ships underwater. In Canada, we are extremely proud of this because this is our contribution to global archaeology. So these, in Canada, these two images are shown more often than anything else. <coughs> so what I'd like to do is just from that starting point, I'd like to, I'd like to talk about what the Basque ships are in Canada and why the Canadian government uh, has invested so much money. You must speak uh, more, more uh, because the people know. know. You don't hear it? Is this better? Can you hear it now? You want me to repeat all of that? No. So I'd like to take some of these sam samples of Basque shipwrecks in Canada and just say what arguments were used in Canada to justify the excavation, the study of these shipwrecks. It may give you some insights into how the Basques are viewed in the world and how they're viewed in Canada. It may be surprising to you, or maybe you know this already. So in Canada, we have 12 known Basque ship and boat remains. I think that I should go over them again from yesterday. Uh, so here we have <coughs> up here in the Strait of Belle Isle we have Red Bay with no less than seven shipwrecks. These are three large ships and four small boats. Then at Chateau Bay a little further there's another large ship. These ships were excavated by Parks Canada. So what is Parks Canada? Parks Canada is a governmental agency, a federal Canadian agency. It was created in the 1950s as the National 
Commission for Historical Sites and Monuments. So what this, and it is, it is associated with the natural park system. So if you go to Canada, you associate the countryside with vast open spaces and national parks like Banff and so on. Well, these historic sites are administrated by the same organization that we call Parks Canada. It's a shortened version of the National Parks, of the Canadian Parks Agency or something like that. So this is a huge organization. Just to give you an idea of how big it is, they have more vehicles than any other government agency except the Army. Uh, so so this, this is a, a, a really big organization. And when they want to invest money into something like Red Bay or into another site, it has to be justified at, on, an, on an administrative level. This leaves a paper trail and we can study it and we can see how archaeologists justified spending, in the case of Red Bay, probably about $50 million over the years. It's a lot of money. Um, if we go a little further, I just want to talk about these wrecks as well. This, these are two wrecks at the, in the Restigouche River. The Restigouche River flows into Chaleur Bay here, and that was the site of the last naval battle between the French and the English in Canada in 1760. I'll talk about that a little bit. All the French ships were actually Basque ships. So, they, so this is another little Basque gra ship graveyard. So what happened in 1760 is that places like Quebec City and Montreal had already capul capitulated to the English, and the French sent a fleet from, from Bordeaux to Canada to try to resupply the troops. What the ships did is they went through here, and instead of going into the St. Lawrence, they went here, where they connected up with indigenous peoples and Acadian uh, rebels who were still fighting, and they decided to make that their battleground. The English, who already controlled the Louisbourg here, saw them, followed them in, and trapped them. So there was a naval battle that lasted about five days. Eventually, the French troops and the French ships ran out of ammunition, and they decided to blow up their ships rather than have them captured. So that's how these ships were there. That was the very first underwater archaeology project in Canada. <coughs> Not by Parks Canada, but by the indigenous community that lived right here. That community is called Listigouche, which is the Mi'kmaq word for Restigouche. So, then, so this native community at Listigouche in 1939 actually took one of these ships, the Marquis de Malos, pulled it out of the water, and put it on exhibition in front of their church. They put a roof over it, that was everything, and for 50 years, that shipwreck was the symbol of the Listigouche Mi'kmaq community. If you talk to people from the community today of a certain age, they all remember as children, they would go on to the wreck and they would play on it. They had different games that they would develop. So they were sailors or they were, you know, if you can, if you can imagine indigenous peoples playing cowboys and Indians, that's what they did. So for two generations of children, they would play on this shipwreck and it became theirs in a certain way. So in 1979, when Parks Canada came into this area and decided to excavate a second of these ships, the Nashville, uh, a political battle developed. The indigenous community wanted Parks Canada to help them with money for their shipwreck, and Parks Canada wanted to build a new visitor center for their shipwreck. And of course, Parks Canada did, did what they wanted to, and the native shipwreck was neglected. Ten years later, Specialists for Parks Canada told the indigenous community that they should disassemble their wreck and put it in a storage area to protect it, which is what happened, and it's still there. It's a little storage area outside the church, about as big as two car garages, and all the ship remains are in there, waiting for somebody to study them since 1989. So the two destinies of these shipwrecks one which was 
part of the indigenous heritage, and one which was part of the Canadian government heritage. They were found within 200 meters of each other. They sank on the same day. The two heritage destinies of these shipwrecks could not be more different. So that gives you an idea of how people approach shipwrecks and how different things happen to shipwrecks depending on what people's motivations are. So that was in the years from 1972 to 79 and on to 1989. And immediately after the Masho excavation was finished, Red Bay was discovered. So that was in 1978. I think you know the story. The uh, historian Selma Barkham came into the Basque country, uh, found, studied, uh, with the help of Basque historians here, studied records that had been unknown to Canadians before. And she went to Canada and told archaeologists, including Robert Grenier, that there were 16th century shipwrecks to be found at Red Bay in Labrador. So the Parks Canada team went there, and after the first dive, they found a shipwreck. This is a fairly famous moment in Canadian underwater archaeology history, where Bruce Bennett, after about 20 minutes of diving, came up to the surface and said, I think we have a shipwreck. It was as easy as that. So in the following winter, Parks Canada needed to justify the whole archaeological campaign that would go into the underwater excavation of Red Bay. And as a matter of fact, the government was threatening to cut entirely the underwater archaeology unit because they had finished at Machot and now they didn't need them anymore. So this unit was actually fighting for its own life. So what they did is they justified it in three ways. Three arguments were used. The first argument was Canada has a 16th century history. Previously, we started Canadian history with the colonization in the early 17th century. And the 16th century was seen as something that belonged to Central America and South America. All of a sudden, Canada had a 16th century history. So this was seen as a source of national pride. The second argument was, who are the Basques? So we are talking about 1979. If you can project yourselves back into the Basque country in 1978-79, these are this is the very beginning of the Basque autonomous community, um, and there are a lot of changes going on in Spain. It's a very hopeful time. Uh, but in Canada, the Basques are seen in a different way. They are seen as a culture with a strong identity, but with no state. And in Canada, at the same time, Canada was suffering or going through a period of rival nationalisms between French and English. And there were also many groups, cultural groups, who were out of the immigration, who said, well, we are neither French nor English, as is my case, and we have an identity as well. This was part of the whole multicultural identity that Canada developed. And the Basques were justified in this sense that they were neither French nor English, but they had a strong identity, and that became part of the Canadian way of seeing the past. So that was the second way of justifying the Red Bay excavation. And the third way, this was an archaeological way. And uh, here I need to talk a little bit about Robert Grenier, who was the new director of the Underwater Archaeology Unit. Robert Grenier was my boss. He is not here. He should be here. Uh, but he was in communication with underwater archaeologists in Europe, in the United States. And he said, this is the moment that we can project underwater archaeology as a new emerging scientific discipline. And we will do it in this new way. So for Parks Canada, this was also the justification to build a capacity of research in underwater archaeology that would be world class. All the contacts with, the, with, with Europe developed from that point on. There was official support for it. And I think that Red Bay was, in fact, that decision, thanks to Robert Grenier, was, is the reason why we are all here today. <laughs> 
And, and it was actually a very good thing for underwater archaeology on a world stage. So there you have entirely different views about this shipwreck here and this shipwreck here. How they are justified, who takes charge of the excavations, what can happen, and so on. Now, as archaeologists here speaking to each other, we need to ask why we study shipwrecks. And I think if we look at how we study shipwrecks and how we talk about them, then we begin to understand why we study them. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit, because it might give you some new ideas, maybe not. So. Um, one of the words that I've been hearing a lot in the last few days, I, told, I said the word bass, another word is technology. So ship, we're interested in the history of technology. So how do archaeologists study technology? We had this idea we call the Shen Opératoire, where we try to collect data on individual artifacts throughout the life of the artifact. So what I've done here is we've, I've just sort of created a pattern which goes around like this. And in the life of any object, we try to collect data on how the primary materials were collected. I'll take, the, I'll take the example of ceramics, or I could take the example of wood. If I took wood, that would be in the forest. How is wood produced? So the forest becomes a place where we study archaeological wood. The next stage is how the, we try to collect data on how the primary material is transformed. So here we are interested in workshops, in places where they cut wood, in places where they put pieces of wood together, uh, and we're talking about the shipyard. Another theme we're interested in is in how materials move around in space. We call this exchange. Wood, we, wood that we acquire in one place is actually sent to another place where the pieces are assembled. So we can exchange the primary materials before or after the assembly, but I put it in this order here. And the last thing we look at is how these things were used. And in the language of archaeologists, we call this consumption. That is how ships how wooden artifacts were used, were occupied. Uh, and that's one of the more interesting things about ship archaeology. Um, back in the 1970s, again when underwater archaeology was taking shape, you could say it was being born, uh, the English underwater archaeologist uh, Keith McElroy uh, conceptualized ships in three ways. Uh, one of them was as a machine, a machine that, was, that had a function of transporting things from point A to point B. Another way of conceptualizing ships for him was the ship as a closed social space. I'll talk more about that later. The ship as a closed social space. And the third way of conceptualizing a ship was its connection to land. McElroy saw the ship as an extension of political and economic systems on land. And that's, those are ways of conceiving consumption here. So those are ways of studying ships. And this is a classic idea in, in archaeology in general. We call it the chaîne opératoire, the sequence of steps that we try to reconstruct for studying any object. We can also study archaeological sites in the same way. We can say that we have one site that is an acquisition site in the forest, another site like a shipyard that is a transformation site, an exchange site which is the wreck when it is found <laughs> somewhere else, and the consumption is the study, it could be the same shipwreck, it could be the study of the, of the interior spaces. So we can, we can actually follow the chaîne opératoire from one site to another, and different sites inform us more or less about certain steps in the chaîne opératoire. So getting to our example of ships again, here we, we know that ships can be studied from different points of view. And when we look at the artifacts from a ship, we need to decide whether these artifacts 
where they, at what stage they are in their life. Are they at the stage of exchange or are at the stage of consumption? This is because shipwrecks are both used, the ships are both used to transport cargoes and there are a living space as well. So if you have an artifact on a ship, a ceramic container, you need to decide whether that ceramic container was part of the cargo in this exchange setting or was, whether it was part of the domestic use of that particular ship. So that's one concept. Um, now I'd like to go on to another aspect and uh, this, is, um, this is what, when we, when we want to look at the society on board a ship, we need to conceptualize it to give, us, give ourselves the tools to get at that society. And I'll do it by looking at, at two or three concepts and I'll just go through them really quickly. Uh, the first one is how <laughs> maritime capitalism is structured. It's not a very complicated thing. Um, in order to finance a voyage, any voyage, there are three sources of capital. One of them comes from the ship owner, who provides the ship. Another one comes from the outfitters. This is an English word that's just kind of hard to translate, but uh, I think we can say armadores. The outfitters. And the last source of capital is the crew itself, which provides its labor. And in the 16th century, In the 16th century, when the Basque crews sailed to Newfoundland for fishing, the crews were not paid until the end of the trip. They were actually shareholders in the voyage, and they risked their own capital and came back and were paid when they returned. They were not wage. They, they did not have a salary or a wage. So that gives you an idea of, of, the, of the capitalist structure. And we also see that these are social groups. I've just, the, I've just conceptualized it here so you can look at it graphically. This is what I do for students because it helps them to remember. So here you have the, the three kinds of investors, the ship owner, the outfitters, and the ship's crew. Each of them provides a certain material <laughs> form of capital. And as archaeologists, we're always interested in the material form of it. So the ship owner provides the ship. The outfitters supply all the materials on board the ship the food and so on, and the crew will often provide personal possessions. These personal possessions are, can be very interesting. And together they make the voyage. If we take this a little further, yeah, they make the voyage. If we take this a little further, the profits also uh, can be traced. So each of these, at the end of the voyage, when the whale oil is sold, the profits are divided equally in three parts. The ship owner gets one part, the outfitters get one part, and the crew gets a third part. This is called a system of parts. It's in every document from the time. <coughs> and at a certain point, the outfit on board the ship is transformed into the paying cargo, which is the whale oil. So depending on which moment the ship wrecked, you can either have its outfit on board or you can have its cargo on board. In the case of the Red Bay ship, the cargo was already on board. So here's a lot of text, which uh, would be interesting to go through. Um, should I talk about this a little bit? I think over time, from the 16th century to the 19th century, you can't say that the system worked the same way over 200 or 300 or 400 years. So what actually happened over time is that the outfitters gained more and more capital. They were the merchants, so they were actually doing less work and they were more expert in investing. So they accumulated more capital and more power and they became ship owners. The crews eventually ceased to be shareholders themselves and they became wage earners and their wages were progressively forced downwards. So by the 19th century, sailors are poorly paid people. The ship owners and the outfitters are the same people, and the power relationships have shifted dramatically from the time of the 16th century. So you need to see this as a historical dynamic that is not static, but continues on. <coughs> 
depending on where your <laughs> shipwreck is, you need to fit it into the right social context. So that's the idea of maritime capitalism, and it, and it gives you an idea of who is on board ship. So let's make this a little more archaeological. What are the social spaces on board a ship? Here we have, I have two examples here. One is a merchant ship, and one is a warship. So these are the spaces. I just colored them. So these pink spaces are used for sailing the ship, for maneuvers and so on. So when we find artifacts from those areas, they usually are associated with the ship's operation. And those artifacts usually belong to the ship owner. Then we have spaces here in green, which is where the crew lives and eats. And if we find artifacts in there, they're usually associated with the outfit that was supplied to feed the crew or with the crew's personal possessions. And then we have this big space in the bottom, which is where the cargo goes. And if we find artifacts from there, this is usually the return voyage when the ship is full of whale oil. So we get this, so when we see these social categories in the spaces of a ship, we begin to see them in archeological terms as well. Let's look at a warship, it's slightly different. This is again the space for maneuvers. Green is the, where the people live. There's a kitchen down here in many cases. And the paying cargo is basically, it's not the paying cargo, it's the food and the supplies for the warship. And we have an extra color here, which is the space where the fighting occurs. This is where the cannon are. So again, we have social spaces that are functional spaces on board a ship. <coughs> that was easy, wasn't it? So now, let's take this one step further and see what happens when a ship wrecks and it becomes a shipwreck. The formation processes of shipwreck sites. This is just a reminder of what a ship can look like in terms of, it, in terms of its functional spaces. And when a ship wrecks, usually, not always, but I'll just give you uh, an example of how shipwrecks can wreck and how they can disintegrate to become archaeological sites. So I have a couple of little drawings here. This shows a ship that is now in the water. Usually when a ship wrecks, it is on the coast. So it will hit the coast roughly in water that is as deep as the water line. In the case of the Red Bay ship, that was about four meters deep. So the ship would have struck the coast at a depth of water of about four meters. But that's not where the ship will sink, will become immobilized. For some time during the wreck process, the ship will still have a little bit of mobility as it's flooding and it will slowly settle downwards. And where the ship will eventually become immobilized in the water is when the water line is above the, the highest deck. That's where the ship will eventually come to rest. And in the case of the Red Bay ship, that was in about 12 to 14 meters of water. So it actually moved downhill in the water before it became immobile. It will usually also tilt over to one side. This movement downhill doesn't go forwards like that, but usually sideways like this. And the ship will tilt, and that's why you get, that's why you get this angle. Now in Canada, we have one factor that you don't have here. We have winter ice. So the following winter, when, when the ice comes in, the upper structures of the ship, everything that projects out of the water, these parts here, are broken. This will happen anyway with waves and so on. So these upper structures will fall on either side of the ship. So the highest structures are actually the lowest stratigraphic level here on either side of the ship. And then the next thing that will happen is that the ship will open. So it's like this, so it'll, it'll break open like that. And these sides of the ship will fall over, the, over these levels and cover them. So now you have another stratigraphic level. And finally, uh, when it all comes down to an archaeological site, there's often 
only a meter or two of remains, and there's just a small bump in the water, and that's what you get here with sediments overlying it. But that stratigraphy from the ship's dis disintegration is still there. So if you understand this, you can begin to analyze the ship from the point of view of the social spaces on board the ship, if you understand the wreck formation process. <coughs> So those are fairly basic ideas about, uh, about uh, shipwreck uh, study, how we begin to see social spaces on board a ship in the way that Keith McElroy suggested we should do this, and that was back in 1972. So we are, we're still working with fairly old ideas. I'll give you some examples because we've been talking theory for a while. I'll just give you some examples that some of my students have been working on. Uh, in the case of the Mashal, uh, artifact distribution. This comes from the doctoral dissertation of Charles Daniel, who some of you know. Um, and here you have the shipwreck here. This is the back of the ship. This is the front with the the etrave here, the bow. This is the stern. So it's, you're actually seeing it upside down. And all the different artifact categories on that ship were mapped. And what Charles found was that all the porcelain came from this part of the ship, near the front. <coughs> There's a large porcelain concentration. Believe me, the sailors did not eat in porcelain plates. This is all cargo. And the cargo was put in the hold near the front of the ship. It was, this warship was actually also sending domestic goods to the colony in order for it to be sold. It was what the French call pacotis. These are small concessions given to the officers that the officers can sell, and that's in exchange for their poor wages. So this porcelain was actually meant to be sold by the ship's officers subsequently. So Charles did this for every, every type of category. So here you see that the different categories of materials on board ship uh, are, have a very distinctive deposition on, uh, pattern on the site. And they also are deposed differently from a stratigraphic point of view. So in this way, Charles was able to distinguish the objects that were part of this paying cargo, an unexpected paying cargo where the sailors, these military officers, were actually small merchants who were hoping to sell material to the colonists in, in Canada. And it he was able to distinguish these small cargoes from the domestic artifacts that were used on board ship by the crew for their life on board ship. So what have we got? If you're interested in doing some more reading about this, uh, there are some uh, researchers that have written on it. I'd like to mention uh, Michel Lourg and uh, Elisabeth Vera, who began thinking about this while they were working on the wrecks at La Natière, uh, they began questioning the functional categories of artifacts on a ship. They had been working with Pax Canada functional categories where they said a ceramic container has a domestic use. And Michel and Elisabeth began to say, no, a ceramic container on a ship can have an exchange use and not just a domestic use. So there was actually a process in which the Pax Canada approach was being questioned by these researchers. And that same line was taken up by Charles Daniel in his doctoral dissertation. So you have a couple of references here. What Charles Daniel proposed was that the materials from a ship can be divided into three social categories. One of them is the cargo, and that cargo can be either the ship's outfit or the ship's paying cargo, depending on the type of voyage it is. Um, there are also objects that belong to the ship's owner. And then there's the whole group of artifacts that are the sailors' personal possessions. These personal possessions were actually brought on board by the sailors. That last category, is very interesting from the Basque point of view. Uh, in Canada, we find 
that Basque ships usually have six kinds of ceramics on board. <laughs> six. Uh, these ceramics either brought food on board, like amphora from Sevilla and stoneware containers from Normandy, or they were used to make food for the whole crew, like cooking pots, or to serve things on the table, like oil, uh, for uh, uh, olive oil containers that were used for service. And finally, there are some artifacts that are high prestige objects, like Majolica from Well in Aragon, that were brought on board as the sailors' individual artifacts. So you can imagine officers around the table, they, put a, they take out their personal cups and they drink out of them on the officer's table. So these ceramics actually have very different functions on board a ship, and they also come from different areas in Europe. The domestic artifacts that the sailors used almost all come from the Basque country, from potteries in Alaba. The food that was brought on board usually comes from far away, as far away as Andalusia and Normandy, whereas the prestige objects come from Majolica factories somewhere in the Iberian Peninsula. They can be in Aragon, or they can be as far, from as far away as the Madrid region. So when we look at these groups of artifacts, we also see the different social categories on board a ship. So how do we do this? Uh, again, this is an, an idea, just a recall of, of the social spaces on board a ship. <coughs> Where the artifacts are found usually helps us to understand who used them. Here you have a view of Red Bay with the excavation going on. You see the shipwreck here. You see the shipwreck is open like the pages of a book. You see here the barge that was used by the divers with the hot water system being pumped down into the divers' suits. Uh, and you see the landscape around with Saddle Island, which is where the whale oil stations, whaling stations were, and so on. So this is the cover of the Red Bay publication, which shows the archaeologists in action. If you recall, this is the third justification for the Red Bay project. Well, that third justification made it onto the cover of the Red Bay report, how we do underwater archaeology. I seem to be missing some, some crucial slides here. What I was hoping to show at this point was um, how these different ceramics are found on board ship. And in one particular case, these cooking pots that come from a place called Zamora, Zamora, which is on the Douro River, close to the Portuguese frontier. These cooking pots and the pitchers that are made from the same, cer same ceramic, these are the most common ceramic materials on board Basque ships. They can form up to 70 or 72 percent of all the remains. So the, this is part of the outfit that was brought, brought on board the ship. But on the Red Bay ship, they actually divide into two categories. One category was found beneath the architectural remains, and the other category is found above the architectural remains. What was found below are only pitchers used at the table to serve wine, and what was found above the architectural remains were the cooking pots used to make common meals. So if we go back to this idea of social spaces on board a ship and the wreck formation processes, these pitchers fell from the highest parts of the ship, from the officer's mess. They were found in the stern area of the ship, and they were the first ones to fall, whereas the cooking pots came from inside the ship on a lower level which is where all the ordinary sailors were and where they ate together, so they fell inside the ship. So you have the same artifact provenance in Zamora, but two types of artifacts. One is a cooking pot, the other one is a pitcher, and they come from different zones of the ship, and they give you perspective on different social categories within the ship's crew. Uh, that's the value of doing careful archaeology, you can actually get into the ship's crew and say who was using what artifact and for what purpose. 
Um, when we look at ships themselves, now we're talking, here we're talking about the ship structure itself. Uh, often we mention technology as one of our motivations for studying ships. Technology, what do we mean with technology? We mean ways of doing things, techniques, how materials were transformed, how industries were created. Uh, and this becomes part of the economic muscle of a region. This is, one of the, this is one of the primary motivations for studying shipwrecks. Very many archaeologists are motivated by it. And I think I am as well. I'm interested in it. This is something that we do from three points of view. We do it, first of all, from the material. We study the material, wood. So we follow the wood from the forest to the shipyard. We do it from a second point of view, which is the architectural design of ships' hulls. This is, a, this is an idea that comes from, the, from the, the discipline of naval architecture. It was transferred to archaeology. And the third way of looking at these shipwrecks from a technological point of view is through the carpentry methods. How was everything done from the tree nails to the large assembly processes and so on? You'd be amazed how long archaeologists can talk about all these things. But who are these archaeologists? Well, I'm not going to say it, but there is an archaeologist in England who has looked at this and she has said, that this is what boys do. So she says that maritime archaeology has a very strong gender basis from this technological point of view. This is something that boys and men are interested in. She also does a profile of them and says very many of them have a military background. Now, this is not the truth today, but back in the days when military service was obligatory in many countries, the Navy also had an academy, and they sponsored a lot of archaeology. This happened in every country in the Western world. So this archaeologist in, in England, her name is Jessie Ransley, she did this gender crit criticism of underwater archaeology. And it's quite funny to read. She's a good writer. Uh, she, she has good observational qualities. Um, and she's interested in why we study ships. She's looking at boys. She says, boys are interested in picking up dirty things, putting them in their pockets, collecting them, taking them apart, see how they work, and so on. So she does this really interesting gender-based analysis of the archaeological discipline. It's great. Read it sometime. I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, it's been an hour since I've been talking to you like a professor and not like a researcher. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and if you want me to talk about ship technology, I'll gladly do it. Thank you. Very much.